a little later on, we're going to hear about a great new exhibition opening in Barrow later this evening, in fact, called Tidal from Signal Film and Media. And we've got two of the artists who are part of that exhibition, as well as Liz Critchley, who's helped organise it, um, to talk to us. We've got Jack Brown and David Haley, who uh, are going to tell us a bit about their, their role in it and what they're doing a bit later on in the call. And before that, we're going to hear um, about uh, what's going on at the Armit in Ambleside, um, which is a lovely place that I don't know much about, if I'm honest with you, um, but there's some new stuff going on there. And I think we've got a little bit of film to watch as well. So I'm gonna hand you over to Kate, who is gonna introduce the person that runs the Armit. Kate. Hello, good morning, everybody. I think I know most people here. Um, my name's Kate and I am the chair of the network. Um, and let me introduce Faye Morrissey, who is from the Armit Museum. Hello, Faye. Hi, hi Kate, hi everybody. Really nice to be here this morning. Um, yeah, it's great to be great to be on CACN and uh, talking a little bit about the Armit, what we've got going on at the moment. Um, and for those of you who don't know me or haven't met me yet, I'm the manager and curator here. Um, I've been in post for about two years and lots of exciting things going on at the Armit and really excited to uh, be continuing on the exhibitions and the program of events. Okay, so not not everybody here will know the Armit. Um, so why don't you just tell us a little bit about what the Armit is and why it's so special? Sure. So um, the Armit's been in establishment for uh, 110 years now. So we celebrated our 110th anniversary uh, last November. Um, it was founded by a lady called Mary Louisa Armit. Um, she was one of three sisters who were born and raised in Salford. Um, so like many other people in the Lake District, um, they moved up here um, for the fresh air, getting away from the increasing industrialization of cities. Um, and she, uh, Mary Louisa, was a very educated, intelligent person alongside her sisters. Um, and through all three of them, they were able to cover all different sorts of subject areas from art, literature, musicology, history, uh, botany. And uh, Mary Louisa was the one who wanted there basically to be a place in Ambleside for academics and book lovers to enjoy and that in time there should be a museum to tell the long history um, of the past to the present um, about Ambleside, its people and the wider Lakeland world. So that's uh, really what we try and hold true to today. Um, there is a library um, where I'm based upstairs at the moment, uh, where we've got about 10,000 plus books um, covering social history, landscape history um, of the Lake District. But through those times, we've gathered huge amounts of other types of uh, objects and artefacts, including, I would say, probably one of the star collections um, in the museum, which is 300 original pieces of Beatrix Potter's fungi watercolours. Um, but that's just one part of some of the amazing material that we have um, and the history of the museum in a nutshell. Great. And um, you've been in post a couple of years. It, it, so did you come just after or during COVID? Forgive me. Yeah, I arrived in March 21. So COVID right. was still lingering around. Um, and yeah, I had to basically help the museum get into position to be able to open from the May. Um, the Armit hadn't opened at all during 2020. So uh, my first job was getting everything in, in place so the museum could open again. And, and how is life now? Is it... Do you feel like visitor numbers are recovering or are you like many other museums kind of lagging behind where we were pre-COVID? I think we're still we're still getting there. Um, visitor numbers are up and down, as I've been speaking to yourself and other colleagues in the sector. Um, obviously, we've kind of moved from pandemic into another different sort of uh, crisis, obviously, with cost of living and taking into account people's spending, how they're spending, what they're spending on. Um, so visitor numbers are decent. Uh, last year was good, better, obviously, than the period in 2020 for the half year. So we're just hoping that we move forwards and grow um, again this year um, with the kind of programme that we're putting in place and keeping an eye on giving people that value um, and that experience um, coming to the museum, be it for general admission events yeah. um, or shop, whatever that might be. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot going on by all accounts, isn't there? And that's kind of why you're here today to talk to us a bit about it. Tell us a little bit about the Charlotte Mason exhibition. 
Sure. So um, hopefully some of you on the call um, may know of the Charlotte Mason College, um, which is where the University of Cumbria is. So the Armit, just again, for those who, who don't know, we're situated at the northern tip of Ambleside um, on the tip of the University of Cumbria Ambleside campus. Um, and we're sort of tucked away quite neatly to the side. And um, we might look small from the front, but I do think uh, the building is like a TARDIS and it opens up. Um, and so we're really well placed with the University of Cumbria being next door neighbors, stakeholders, um, and that are on the original site of the Charlotte Mason College. And prior to that, Charlotte Mason's original House of Education that she set up in uh, 1892. And Charlotte Mason was a pioneer in educational kind of reform, uh, philosophies, methods, um, and she's very popular with the homeschooling network, both within the UK and hugely predominant in America. And uh, we have a lot of American following um, for that. And the reason why we've got an exhibition about her this year is because it's 100 years since her passing. Um, so we're celebrating her life and her legacy and what her methods and things show for and are still relevant for the present day. Um, because the exhibition is titled Learning Through the Natural World. So it's all about illustrating her life but also about how she advocated for children to get out there and learn from being outdoors and learning in nature. Um, people, uh, not just children, um, but they can learn not just about science and geography from being outdoors, but literature and history um, and well-being as well, which is so important right now. And so I think a lot of what she was practicing 100 years ago plus is still just as relevant to today. So we're really celebrating that through this exhibition, charting her life. Um, and we've got contributions from a variety of different people, individuals, organisations. So obviously we're partnered with the University of Cumbria and we've got a whole events programme running alongside our exhibition on site here with talks and panel discussions coming up, um, at least one activity a month. We've got workshop here on site about nature journaling coming up, I'm talking about that in a second. Um, and yeah, it's just a really exciting time for this exhibition to be happening. And we do hope as many people come along as possible. You don't have to have a background or a preconceived idea about education. It's just coming along, finding out about this Another incredible woman who perhaps is uh, not well known and um, just like the Armit sisters. So we're trying to raise profile and uh, recognise her achievements. Great, great. Amy, can you just show us the website? Because I was having a little look earlier and I was really impressed with um, if you could just scroll up to show us the um, illustrations that are on the I just I thought it looked beautiful. Um, what you've done there on the website just to sort of give us a flavour of what that, that exhibition is all about. Well those illustrations um, are actually taken from students nature journaling um, so they're original illustrations that we've used from uh, one of the Charlotte Mason students I believe it's 1920s and they're stunning they're stunning they were taught how to draw and their brush drawing skills is just incredible. Yeah well I would um I'd encourage people to go and have a rummage on your website because I think it's really good and uh, it gives you a real flavour. Um, we might have a little look at the video um, in, a, in a little while, um, time permitting. Um, it's only 30 seconds. Let's do it, Amy, shall we? Hello, my name is Charlotte Mason. I've been involved in education for the whole of my life. Did you know, though, that it is 100 years since my passing? There are some wonderful celebratory events exploring my life and work and legacy here at the Armut Museum and at the University of Cumbria. Yeah, we don't need Jimmy Carr, thank you. Um... <laughs> I love that. We were all meant to be naturalists. I absolutely love that. <laughs> I love those illustrations. Um, so I can't wait to get down and see it all. It's very much up my street. Excellent. Good to know. <laughs> is the uh, is the artist commission that's currently um, on offer from the army linked to that exhibition, or is it a separate thing? No, it's absolutely linked. Um, so, so tell us about got... that then. 
Yeah, so we've got an artist opportunity or an artist or a creative practitioner. Um, deadline is this Sunday. So anybody interested um, on the call, please get in uh, soon um, or pass it on now um, to anybody you might know. Um, and it is all about this workshop that I mentioned around um, nature journaling. So Charlotte Mason encouraged her students. So these were uh, young ladies at the time um, going in and learning how to be a teacher or often a governess, as the case may be. And she encouraged them to keep their own nature journal, which um, encompassed basically going out into the environment, tracking down different types of flora um, and noting it down um, in terms of where and when they might have found it, but also noting it in more of sort of a diary entry as well. So in each of the journals, we have a date and then there might be a paragraph or so or a page, depends on how uh, intricate the particular student was getting into what they discovered. And it doesn't just cover um fact and uh, things but it also includes opinions it includes thoughts and feelings about where they were and what they felt about the environment uh, there's also poems in there so there's quite a lot of wordsworth that comes up and um, there are uh, drawings um, of the flora and um, some drawings are better than others <laughs> I will <laughs> note um, so some of those drawings that you've just seen um, are some of I would say the better ones but they're still incredible and they're really talented so as I say it's encompassing the science the literature the the well-being um, and the arts into into these journals and Charlotte Mason encouraged this so that they could then go on and teach it to the young people that they would be uh, caring for or looking after. And we're looking for an artist to replicate that with young people today, um, young people from schools um, across uh, Cumbria. Um, so we're looking for an artist or a creative practitioner uh, with the skills um, and the tools to enable young people to go out into the environment and produce their own nature journals. So the first session would be this introductory session where the artist would lead the students, explain what they were going to be doing, and then take a trip out from the Armit. They'd be based here at the Armit for the sessions and go out from the front door um, into the landscape and see what they can find and discover, come back, note it all down, give them the tools and techniques to go away for a few weeks, do their own nature journaling from home. And it doesn't matter where they are, whether they're within Cumbria and the National Park and have easy access to green spaces, or if they've just got a window box, for example, or something that they can see or walk to their nearest small pocket park or whatever it might be. Uh, we're aware that not everybody has great access to the outdoors. Um, so we're encouraging that as well. Um, and okay. then there'll be a follow up session um, afterwards. And so how should anybody who is interested um, respond to that? Uh, Amy's put the link uh, to the opportunity in the website and you, you say that that needs to be back by Sunday. Yes, by end of day Sunday, please. Um, so if people can, um, it'll have my details on and I'll put it in the chat um, shortly. Uh, send in a CV a covering letter um, detailing about why you think you'd be uh, good for the role and um, a link or um, uh, some attachments to some portfolio work that you can show us as an example um, so that we can then go through and select some candidates uh, for interview at the start um, or in the second week okay. um, of April. It does sound so interesting. I do think actually I was meant to be a Victorian lady just spending my days nature journaling. <laughs> It'd be um, a nice way to spend your day. <laughs> but maybe, maybe I'm looking at that through rather rose tinted glasses. But uh, <laughs> uh, it, I think, and isn't it current today? Because actually, journaling and nature journaling is is all the rage. I think, um, in terms of you know collecting your thoughts and maintaining your well being, it sounds very very interesting and relevant. Absolutely. So that's not the only thing that's happening at the moment, is there? Because I read in a press release recently that you have also just had a, a quite a major new acquisition to your collection. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so we've been fortunate to acquire a original George Romney portrait um, of uh, a neighbour or not far up the road, a mile north. Um, it is showing a portrait of Sir Michael the Fleming, uh, fourth baronet of Rydal Hall. So we were really fortunate to acquire this through funding um, from the Beecroft bequest um, and through the Friends of 
the Armit. Um, and so it's now in a pride of place spot in one of our first galleries, spotlighting this new acquisition. Um, and we're looking forward to doing some more research around Michael of Fleming, particularly. Um, I know there's an article in the Westmoreland Gazette uh, from previously looking like he was a bit of a playboy. So we're going to do some more research into that. But it's a real, real coup um, for us to have an original Romney um, in our collection. Yeah. And um it's not just the fact that it's a Romney because you know let's be honest there's there's thousands of them I think it's the it's the local relevance isn't it that's really really interesting and yeah and absolutely yeah um so we've got things in our collection linking to Rydal Hall and the estate so it's a lovely way to um finish that off and obviously as you say that local connection so that people can find out a little bit more about uh, another yeah. significant person um great uh I should also say that the Armit is one of the partners on the Helping Hands project, uh, are you not? Uh, there are 32 museums, theatres, art centres across the county, all part of the Helping Hands project, uh, which is about breaking down barriers to volunteering. And uh, are you, have you been able to uh, recruit a volunteer or two yet? Yeah, we've had uh, one volunteer start her um, induction with us. Um, so she's going to be doing some research and some archive digitization um support with us so we're really pleased about that and we uh we should be having another person join us soon as well great and for anybody who's interested there are scores and scores of new volunteer opportunities on the helping hands website which we'll put into chat in a moment but thank you for being um a really active partner in the project um, there is one question here in the chat from Tim Coon who asks, does the Armit have links with the forest schools in Cumbria? Good question. Um, the answer, uh, or the basic answer is no, but we'd love to. Um, we'd love to do more collaborative work with people. I'm always looking out for, for partners. So um, if you can put me in touch with anybody, um, Tim, that would be amazing. I know University of Cumbria has uh, a few links with the forestry schools, so um, we can either follow it up through that or if you've got direct connection, please let me know. Well, why don't you put your details in the chat uh, so that anybody here can get in touch with you about that. Tim, do you want to say anything about it? Uh, well, it was only that, um, uh, yeah, there's, in North Cumbria, there's a bit of a sort of movement towards, towards that, but I think that link is important, but also with the Harmony Project, which is uh, nature and education through the Sustainable Food Trust is another really useful resource uh, for uh, educationists to use, either in the home schooling connection or forestry school, or indeed the Armit Centre, which I'm afraid I hadn't come across before. So that's brilliant to hear about it this morning. Great, well, thanks so much, Tim. I'll look into it, thank you. Okay. I love it when the network uh, puts people in touch with each other and makes connections. Thank you so much, uh, Faye. Um, Tom, is there time for any more questions? Yep, if anyone's got anything else. Anybody got any more questions for Faye? I would recommend a visit to the Armit highly. What's it like running a museum, a little museum? Not that it's little, Faye, but what's it like running, you know, a museum right now in Cumbria for you? Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, um, in all honesty, I'd never been to the Armit before I moved up here. Uh, so I'm from Lancashire originally, um, and I know South Cumbria fairly well um, from regular holidays and trips trips up to here. Um, but when I first joined, I just thought, gosh, you know, as I say, it's a TARDIS. Um, and I've thoroughly enjoyed getting to know about the collection and the various items and the huge amount of stories and people's associations that the museum has. And for me, it's a real privilege to be able to take the museum forward into a new time, you know, um, not least with COVID has changed loads of things to do with how visitors are returning to the Lake District and different types of audiences. So it's a real privilege to yeah, be here and moving it forwards and finding out more about local people and networking and speaking to all of you here today. And are you dependent on visitor income or do you get income from other places or how does the thought, how do the finances work? Yeah, so we're an independent trust and charity, so uh, we don't get local authority or local government funding um, or funding from the university, for example. So, yeah, all our um, all our admissions, our event um, intake, donations, shop purchases, all go back into ensuring that the museum can operate for the future. Okay, and is it one? Is it you plus a few other people, or how many sort of staff? You so there's myself as a full time member of staff. I've got three excellent part time members of staff and then we've got a team of about 15 to 17 active volunteers. OK, and what are the sort of board of trustees? 
yes, and a board of trustees, yes, who are all, again, voluntary and uh, very much behind pushing the armit forwards. Okay, great. Lovely. That's really interesting. Thank you for, for, for sharing that and uh, good luck with the new stuff. I'm, I'm aiming you. absolutely. What, how, how, long is it, what, how long is the exhibition open until, Faye? The exhibition is on throughout the year up until December before okay. we close for Christmas. So plenty of time to come and see us. Great. And good luck with that um, opportunity that you put out there. I hope you get someone good to, to make that all happen. Thank you. Yes, thanks, everyone. All right. Stick around, Faye, because we've got some great stuff coming up from, from Signal now. Um, and I think I can see Lauren has joined the call as well. Um, so we're going to now cross to uh, Sunny Barrow, uh, where the sunshine always exudes into the inhabitants of Barrow. And uh, Liz Critchley, who is one of the people... So, Liz, am I right in thinking that Signal quite recently became an Arts Council NPO? If I got that wrong? Yes, you are correct. Yes, so we that, did. So, that, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm always fascinated by how things are funded in Cumbria. So again, for those of you who don't know, an NPO is a national portfolio organisation. Um, and it means you've got guaranteed funding from the Arts Council for three years, um, was four during the pandemic. Obviously, lots of strings attached, investment principles to adhere to, blah, blah, blah. But I think for Signal, was it the first time that it's become an NPO? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was. It was the first time for us. So yeah. That so must be really a, really, a really good moment. Yeah, um, incredible moment. Yeah. OK, so um, I'll shut up. Liz, Liz is one of the people that runs Signal. And we've got this great exhibition opening tonight called Tidal. So we're going to hear from Liz and then we're going to hear from a couple of the artists involved in uh, in displaying and showing their, their work um, at that exhibition. So, Liz, uh, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much. Yep. So could you pop my slides on if you don't mind? Thank you. Brilliant. So we're really excited actually to have you with us today in the galleries. Um, just rather than me talking with a with a blank wall behind me. So although you can see a blank wall behind me, we're going to turn it around shortly and you'll get a look at some of the galleries and what's been happening today. Um, we're quite busy. So if you see things going on in the background, my apologies. But um, but yeah, that's just part of the experience of today's call. So I'm here to talk about Tidal, uh, which is our new exhibition that's opening tonight, the 31st of March at 5.30. And we're working with um, three artists. We've got Jack Brown with us, who's going to talk later with his exhibition, You and Me Outside. And then we've also got Dr. David Haley and Ellie Hoskins, and David's going to talk to you later as well. And they were part of our um, digital arts development lab, David and Ellie. So their exhibitions are on too. So if you could put the slide on for me. Thank you. So it's a really exciting new exhibition of artworks showing at Cook Studio in sunny Barrow in Furness, as Tom just said. And we're open throughout April until the 29th from Wednesday to Saturday at 10 till 4. And really, the Tidal programme is focusing on the unique identity of the Furnace coastline. So Jack's been working with local young people. David's exhibition is Equinox, A Day with an Ocean's Edge, and he'll talk about that later. And then we've also got Ellie Hoskins' Fly on the Wall. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about Ellie's exhibition before I pass you on. Next slide, please. Yeah, just because she's not here to talk about herself, I just wanted to mention her micro commission Fly on the Wall, which is a really playful interaction between animation, text and sculpture. And the protagonist that you can see on the left there, it's just like absolutely hilarious animation. Um, she she really doesn't want to go outside, no matter no matter kind of what the temptation is, whether it's it's visiting the coast or visiting nature, she just can't find herself. There's too many domestic things to get used to to actually that actually stops her going outside. And there's a fly on the wall who you can see in the other picture. Um, and he's really shouting at her and pulling various faces and trying to stop her going outside. Um, and I think he ends up calling her a piece of shit, which is <laughs> which is quite funny. I think we allude quite a lot to that. Yeah, so that's kind of our, our third exhibition, which is in the upstairs gallery. Um, next slide, please. I'm just going to whiz through these because I really want to pass you on. Yeah, so just finally for me, it's just an invite to our, our launch tonight on Friday the 31st of March, which is today, 2023 at 5.30pm. Um, everybody's welcome. Please come along. Uh, we'll be on for a couple of hours. So if you don't come at 5.30, come later on and just, just have a preview of the exhibition. Um, and I'm going to pass you on to Jack because he's going to give you a first preview before the preview of some of the artworks that we've got on display. Thank okay, you. And before we come to Jack, um, uh, Liz, just tell us, so where did the concept of this exhibition, which is I think, exploring the connections between the centre of Barrow and the coastline, where did that all where did that idea come from? Lauren, do you want to explain that one for me if you're on the, the talk? <laughs> Uh, 
Here's Lauren. Hello. Hello. Lauren, so Lauren, if you just introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was just busy working in the office. I'm Lauren, one of the directors. <laughs> Thank you, I just thought it was quite a nice question. Don't put me on the spot because I wasn't prepared to be. Good job I put some makeup on. I was, didn't know I was going to be. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, just... um, for, for a long time, um, we've been wanting to focus more of our work on environmental issues. And um, one of the things that comes up a lot um, with people we work with in Barrow and all of the staff here is that one of the most pressing sort of concerns is Barrow's um, sort of connection to the coast. And that's where Barrow mainly sort of butts up against nature and the impacts of um, the climate crisis. Um, so from talking to everyone, we devised a project really that was about really trying to reconnect um, ideas and thoughts um, to do with um, the coastal environment, because obviously I'm sure you all know the coast around Barrow is just so absolutely beautiful and diverse. Um, and so the starting point of the project was to spend time with um, an ecologist called Steve Benn, who talked to a lot of the artists and community groups um, uh, in detail. So fascinating about all of the um, all of the important um, nature and um, wildlife and also concerns um, to do with the coast. So that was the starting point. And then we devised, devised this project, really. So it's about reconnecting with nature, um, but also about thinking about the wider kind of global issues. And we, we wanted to take the coast as a starting point, but um, next year we might pick another interesting natural asset of Barrow to work on. You have to watch this space. <laughs> Great, thank you, Lauren. Right, Liz, do you want to introduce Jack then, and then we'll cross to Jack? I do, yeah, I'm just looking at him now. So I'm going to pass you on to Jack with his gimbal um, and he's going to walk around the exhibition now and he's going to show you some of the work that he's been doing with our youth group and also some of his own work. Um, yeah, and you're going to get a sneak preview. And I'm just encourage everybody, if you pin Jack's window, so the top three buttons on your screen, um, on Jack's window, if you pin it, you'll get it nice and big on your screen if we're going to have a little walk around. So over to you, Jack. Okay, so... First of all, hello. Uh, my name's Jack Brown. I'm an artist and I've been working with a group of young people from uh, Chetwin School, um, which is just up the road in Barrow. And we started a project about a month and a half ago. Um, I'm going to... Let me just get this camera to work where I want it to go. I'm going to turn my screen around now, actually, so I can start to show you the work. And I'm going to show you... There's actually 10 new works that we've made in sort of like as a team in collaboration uh, i'm going to show you five of those works um, that kind of each one i think sort of describes a different aspect of how i worked with young people and what we made so let me flip my screen over right so the first work i want to just share with you and um, we are still in the middle of an install so there are a few wires and stuff hanging around but the first work um is this one which is walking sticks and branches so at this very on our very first meeting, um, I basically had purchased some walking sticks for us all, and I measured each young person up and cut a walking stick aside so they had their own personal walking stick for our explorations. Um, and I knew I wanted those to become part of the exhibition somehow. Um, and then, sort of by chance, on another wander up near the slag heaps, um, there were some of these beautiful twigs that had just been. Uh, I, I presume a hedge had just been sort of trimmed back um, for the year. So we collected those. And then again, like through chats and talks with the young people, we decided we'd like to display them sort of like this. Um, so I suppose to illustrate how we worked, um, we definitely decided we wanted these sticks and twigs to be sort of displayed in this way. And then I was the one who had to go and work out how to do all the gubbins, if that makes sense. So I kind of worked as a, um, a technician for the group in a way. So I would bring sorts of ways of making choices into the project. And then once those choices were made, I'd then sort of facilitate making them into artworks. Um, the next one I want to show you are these foams. Um, these are actually normally used. I'll just show you the side of this box. Normally these are used um, if you were getting an orthopedic shoe fitted or a very posh trainer fitted, you put your feet into these normally um, and then send them off to the trainer maker or shoemaker and um, you get a cast of your foot through it. But actually I've worked with this foam before. I've worked with floral foam before, the green stuff. This is the same material, but a different color. And I know it takes really beautiful imprints. So we use these uh, 
we collected objects from around the coast and then we use them to make these kind of like sculptural responses to the coastal environment. And you'll see what is really nice is that people started to add themselves into the work. Um, so there's little handprints and stuff. So what was important about this um, project for me, having worked in education for quite a long time, having worked in schools, having worked in with a lot of young people doing GCSE art particularly, is that I made a point of avoiding all normal art skills. So there's no drawing at all in this project. Um, there's no imitating life at all, really. Um, because I knew, and I remember it from my kind of like days at school as well, um, that leads to kind of anxiety and sort of like stress about getting things right. And also it could mean that the work goes into a portfolio and then the project changes because we're trying to make it fit to school criteria. So yeah. This is an example of basically trying to find a really innovative way of getting them to respond, respond directly to the environment, but doing so without having to have developed a skill, if that makes sense. There are skill in these works. We practiced a few before we made the final ones um, and they're very skillfully made. They're beautifully composed, but they didn't have to draw a shell, for example, which is kind of like standard art GCSE drawing a shell, you know, um, so I was avoiding that as much as I could. Um, I'm going to just change now quickly to these large sculptures in the middle. So these are works that I kind of made in response to the project. Um, so from the outset, I've, I've, one thing that I'm always really aware of is using words like collaboration um, too easily. So there were points in this project where we were working as a team. Um, there were points when I was working outside of the team of young people to make work in response to what we'd done. Um, and there were points when actually, I'll show you in a minute, where we made things that didn't work and failed. Um, but these works basically are driftwood collected from Warnley, uh, South Warnley Nature Reserve. And within the wood, if I can get close up to one of them, um, there are hundreds of fake nails, fake fingernails pressed into the wood. Um, so these works kind of emerged from the project. We were talking a lot about crossing over points and stepping out into the unknown. Um, we were, we actually tried to make rubbings um, of these pieces of driftwood, which kind of worked all right, but didn't really become part of the exhibition. And actually throughout the project, um, each young person developed their own sort of like theme, like a, almost like a sub theme. Um, so from the main theme that was pretty much exploring the coast, trying something new, um, leaving the classroom, leaving the school, a lot of the young people started to find themes such as identity, um, access, um, self-expression, nature and us came up quite a lot. The climate crisis sort of arrived and went within our discussions. So yeah, these works kind of ended up coming out of their discussion. So, also, Barrow High Street's full of fake nail bars as well. So there's kind of like a, a sort of in and out town and town and coast. Um, yeah, so these weren't made collaboratively. I made them, but the thought process was collaborative, if that makes sense. So they kind of came out of the process of working with young people. Um, right. One other thing. I've got two more works to show. Okay. Amongst the experiments in the landscape, um, one thing we did to make sound artworks was we used these quite a lot. There's some images of us. I, I'm gonna, there's some images on this pipe of us using them in the, in the landscape um, to kind of make like a, a sound art thing. John, the technician is gonna demonstrate for you. Thank you, John. Um, so again, they were kind of, they were there on the first week when we went for our wander. Um, they were how we started to interact with the soundscape of the place. Um, we also used gymnastic ribbons to play with the winds and then eventually made our own hand colored and hand dyed ribbons for the exhibition, which have kind of personal 
uh, responses to things about identity. They mentioned the things that we saw and walked along. Um, yeah, so that became a work as well. Sort of out of us mucking around and playing around, um, we ended up making a sort of work together. So again, we all really loved using the gymnastic ribbons. We all had these mini themes coming out. And then I, as a technician, went away and worked at how to do this kind of boutique effect. Um, and then they made them. So there was a lot of that, a lot of me working things out. Right, the final work. There is going to be a big film here that's not up yet called Hiding. Um, let me turn the screen just so you can see my face while I describe this. So it's not there yet, but I'm going to describe it. It's a film of the young people hiding in the landscape. Um, it's definitely worth coming to the exhibition for this. So one thing, again, that emerged just from working with that particular group of young people and working with the constraints they work within, three of them didn't have any photo permission. Um, and the group knew who that three were, the teachers knew who that three were. But on the first session when we were taking photos, they were asked to stand aside. Um, and it kind of, it really made me think about how can I make sure these young people are involved in the project? because I can't take photos of him, you know, so, and I'm, I'm filming everything as we go along. So it reminded me of a work, a work that I've had in the back of my head about hiding um, just as a thing. Um, and so the work that will eventually be on this big screen um, is gonna be called Hiding. And it's a film where at points you can't see anything. You can just hear the audio and you can hear me and the young person talking about where they're gonna go and hide. And, is it over there and you know, you've got 10 minutes and then you'll hear them walking off. And then as soon as they're hidden, it's just a still shot of that landscape for as long as they're hiding it. So they're in there somewhere, but they're hidden away. Um, and I think the longest still shot is 10 minutes where they hide. So that became a really nice work. Um, the last one I'm gonna show you, like I said, there's loads more stuff happening. There are a few works that are gonna go here the uh, drawings with hermatite, which is the ore that you extract steel from. And this work is a karaoke song the young people wrote about the project, um, filled with our kind of like reflections about what was going on. And with the wonders of technology, what should happen if I press this button, see if this works. So this should stop playing the tune. It's a Call Me Maybe, the song, you'll recognise it probably. So if you come to the exhibition, um, this isn't quite working yet, but the microphones, you get to sing along with the work in response to what they thought about the project. Yeah, so that's kind of another work that totally came out of their own um, way of working, the, the way, their way of responding to the landscape. And I'm just going to move away from that music now because it'll play all the way through. So that's kind of in a roundabout way, the whole show. There's still work going on. There's still cables to be fixed. Um, there's still some tables that are documenting things that didn't quite work, which I think is important. So again, um, in quite an, un, an unschooly sort of way, there was quite a lot of discussion about things that we're gonna try and if it doesn't work, that's fine. So when we were doing the karaoke work, it was because it was raining actually, we had a couple of days where it rained and we couldn't go out. It was really, really raining heavily, it was snowing almost. So we had a day in the studio, that's when we made the, um, that's when we made these work. Oop. That's when we made the ribbons. Um, and that's when, that's when we came up with the idea of the karaoke song. So we had a, we had a morning to try and, put a song together. I left them to it. I was working on some other sculptural works and they just pulled this song out of the bag out of nowhere um, that was full of really quite personal responses to feeling quite nervous about working with someone they didn't know and getting out of the house was quite a, a thing for them. Um, so yeah, and actually the, what's come out the end of this project is that we've got some really positive feedback from the school, unprompted feedback, uh, which is really nice. So before we'd asked for the proper, please can you do the feedback? We got some lovely emails from the teacher saying how much the young people had uh, sort of come out themselves through the project. Um, 
And I, again, I'd probably point back to the fact that I was quite careful with the type of art we made from the start. So, um, that's great, Jack. Yeah. Um, Thank so you. yeah, basically I'm going to carry on insulting it all now. Um, and we're going to pass yeah, the So I just want to say artist. really good example of a kind of walk and talk and explainer that you've done for us there. I've got a real sense of the exhibition. You've got a lovely clear camera, um, whatever you, it is you're using as well and a really nice way of explaining the origins of everything as well. But I'm really conscious, I want to get David in on the, is David yeah. downstairs or upstairs from you? David, yes indeed. He's upstairs, <laughs> all right, okay. All right. Um, and by the way, you know, anything to do with karaoke, I know Richard Foster will be there before you can shake a, a horse's tail at it and he'll be there. Right, I expect to see him singing then. Yeah. Um, Thanks a lot. Thank you ever so much, Jack, good luck and have a good time this evening and I can't wait to see it, it's gonna be great. Cheers, thank you. <laughs> David, David of the Haley, uh, Haley, 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 Haley. Yes, like Haley. Um, over to you to tell us what 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 you've been doing for the exhibition. Okay, so uh, I'm upstairs from Jack um, in the, uh, the the upstairs gallery. Um, you can probably hear some um, singing in the background. Um, that's Jess Dandy, um, uh, an internationally renowned uh, contralto singer from Barrow. Um, and this project allowed me to um, meet with her for the first time. I'd heard her on a few occasions um, at uh, the Coro in, in Ulverston and also uh, St. Mary's Church at Furness in Barrow, uh, where they have a fabulous uh, programme of classical music these days. Um, and working with her was one of the high spots probably of my career, to be perfectly honest. Um, and the signal theme of Tidal um, really touched with me. I live on Walney Island, I've uh, been there for six years now. Um, and despite um, working with ecological projects, um, specifically on the Nexus, of climate, species, and cultural crises uh, since 1992. Um, I very rarely worked in my own back garden, as it were. Um, but this tidal theme um, really touched me living on Warney uh, because I actually live on Ocean Road. And besides Ocean Road, um, there's a salt marsh. Um, a lot of local people actually refer to it as the gullies. Um, and everybody seems to know about the, um, the nature reserve uh, of South Walney and the seals. Uh, and they know about um, North Walney nature reserve and the bird sanctuary up there. Um, and they also know about um, Bigger Bank and the Irish Sea, uh, which is actually where this project started. Um, but I, I love the way in which uh, projects in fact morph from one thing to another to another. So uh, this project started at Bigger Bank uh, on the west coast of Walney Island um, and ended up um, at Tummer Hill Salt Marsh, uh, which is on the west, on the east side, sorry, of, of Walney. Um, so between Ocean Road and Bigger Village, there is this fabulous salt marsh. Um, and I'm going to play with this gimbal thing now. So you must excuse me. Uh, I'm not as good as Jack on this, but here we go. If we turn around, and then I'm going to to whoa, that wasn't what was meant to happen. Yeah. And yes, how's that? Um, this is basically the installation. So um, on the day of the equinox, which is the, the vernal um, time of year uh, that the spring comes. Uh, many cultures and faiths spend their time uh, celebrating this in different festivals in different ways. Um, the Signal team and myself uh, spent the day filming from two uh, locations, one on Ocean Road uh, and the other on uh, Bigger Village. Um, I should add the following day, uh, Ocean Road was flooded um, and also Car Lane, which take you to uh, bigger village was flooded, so we wouldn't have been able to get there to do this filming. Um, and it's, as the, the title of the, the piece says, it's uh, a day with an ocean's edge. 
so um, the Equinox gives you just over 12 hours of daylight to be able to film. And the cycle of the tides here um, is just over 12 hours. That's no, just over six hours, a big pardon, each one. So uh, we managed to get an entire cycle in um, in that day. Uh, and that's what this film shows over the two screens. The two perspectives, um, we developed the idea so that we could have uh, a conversation. Uh, and the conversation is between the sea, which is just Dandy's voice, um, and myself, in fact. Um, and the conversation um, is about asking questions, uh, some of them quite difficult questions um, about the way in which we treat these uh, fabulous natural phenomena, um, the value of these places, um, the wildlife that's there, um, the carbon that is um, absorbed by such sea marshes, um, and the fact that, uh, in fact, this particular marsh um, doesn't have a, a particular um, centre or anything attached to it. It is a part of the Morecambe Bay and Dudden um, Triple SI, which is uh, sites of scientific interest. It's also um, um, EU designated uh, place of conservation and high biodiversity. And indeed, um, it's listed on the Ramsar um, Convention for Outstanding um, Wetlands. Um, the idea of the, the conversation between the sea and the salt marsh um, is hopefully the start of a dialogue that will take place locally. Um, there are various uh, schools and um, groups who are coming to visit the exhibition. Um, I'm going to be around to talk to quite a lot of people over the time. Um, and so the dialogue we hope will, and that's John coming in to carry on with something. Uh, the dialogue we hope will basically start to raise questions about really valuing these kind of places. Interestingly, um, on Wednesday, um, I received an email from um, a friend in, tai in Taiwan, um, where I did a project in 2007, uh, which was a dialogue with oysters, um, the art of facilitation. And I'll just read you a little bit from her email. Um, Budai, which is the place um, on the northwest coast of Taiwan in the Taiwanese Straits. Uh, Budai wetlands are under good development with Kaohsiung Wild Bird Society has stepped in and takes responsibility for the habitat, conservation and preservation. The documentary filmmaker, Tsai Chao Tiao, became their project manager to preserve the rest and the, oh, and the rest of the salt fields. Sorry, I'm trying to uh, also translate a bit here. Uh, keeping these salt fields a habitat for wild birds. Um, they host various activities to educate school kids, local residents, tourists, even the employees from the solar company based in another salt field in Budai. Wow. Three weeks ago, a renowned Taiwanese filmmaker, Liang, um, had his work premiered in the film Caring for Blackface Spoonbill in Taipei, documenting people who devoted themselves to the efforts of saving habitats for wild birds and black faced spoon pills in particular. These are an indicator species of healthy wetlands. So it's, that was just out of the blue that they'd arrived on Wednesday. Um, and it was kind of interesting how these wetlands um, are linking with other wetlands globally um, to see how they can benefit us, um, as I say, in, in pushing nature back <laughs> um, into our lives uh, and also uh, reducing the effects of climate change. David, that's that's where we shall leave it um, because we're coming up to half past 10. That, that's been a really, again, a really good insight into the thinking behind your exhibition and how it's going to look as well. It looks fantastic. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to just sort of resting there and, and, and observing this 
you know, period of time that you've recorded and filmed. It looks really, what a really, really interesting thing to do as well. Um, thank you so much for sharing. Are you gonna be ready in time for this evening? Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the man getting the hammer and I, I just began to worry slightly on your behalf, but that, that looks great. Um, and uh, thank you for sharing it with us uh, as well. Good luck with it and thank you. And thank you to Jack as well for great insight as, as to what else is going on. So what a, what a rich exhibition. Everybody, Liz, Lauren, David, Jack, you must be feeling pretty good uh, and proud of what you what it's all come together and what a sort of big theme that you've chosen, you know, that relationship between coast and urban and, and what, what it's produced um, and working with a lot of community stuff as well. A lot of young people will benefit and who knows where they may go in the future with their artistic persuasion. Liz, thank you for, for pulling all that together for us. You're very welcome. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for yeah. having us. Yeah, pleasure. Absolute pleasure. All right, everybody. Well, next Friday is Good Friday, unbelievably. So I'm going to be eating chocolate between 9.30 and 10.30. So there's going to be no call. Uh, no, chocolate, that's Easter Sunday, isn't it? What? I should be doing something else on Good Friday, sorry. But anyway, I might have broken into my Easter eggs already. But anyway, so there's no call next week, 9.30 to 10.30. But the following week, there is. We've got a pretty special one. You may have heard of this project, 10,000 Daffodils, that's been chuntering away for the last sort of nine months or so. Um, it's a bit like those red porcelain poppies that were done for Remembrance Sunday, but but it's a Cumbrian yellow daffodil version of that, all in aid of six local charities, um, run by a really inspirational person called Helen Holland. Um, uh, she's going to be talking to us about that because they're about to start planting the daffodils at Lalva. I think they actually open at the end of April, but it's been a huge mammoth operation to, to create 10,000 ceramic daffodils. So she'll give us an insight as to how that's happened, how she got the funding and how she made the project come together. And we're also gonna hear about the, the Forge Festival, which is coming to Windermere Jetty. Um, Simon is gonna tell us about the plans for that, which is the Young Person's Dance Project, um, which, is, which was fantastic last year. Um, and they're gonna tell us what the plan is for this year. Uh, with the Forge Festival. So that should be really interesting too. So that is the plan for two weeks time. In the meantime, um, have a good, I'm off to see Kim Moore this evening at Maryport. She's a poet, Kim Moore, that you'll all know. Uh, she's gonna, she's also a trumpet player, as you probably know, she's written a book about that. And I think there's gonna be some, some brass band music going on at the same time. So that should be interesting. Um, I hope you all have uh, nice times as well and uh, have a nice Easter. Um, if you get a break, enjoy a break. And uh, may the weather be good for gardening. And I'll catch you all again soon. Thanks very much again to Faye, to Liz, to David and to Jack um, for all your contributions this morning. It's been great to get an insight into your work and uh, see you in a fortnight, everybody.